the you business would, models take uh, business models take take many different forms, and uh, it isn't necessary that your business model have a plan whereby you remain in in situ in the place you're in, because it's a it's a you know the art and its place in our lives is a, is a global phenomenon. And after after I went to French and Company and got that met all these people and mounted the first David Smith sculpture show in many years it was the uh, it was the show of the year in 1961 in, in New York and he took me he thought I was a wunderkind because I sold so much work but I met so many people in that short period of time when it was easy in New York because it was all integrated music dance <coughs> And the plastic arts was all one world and fashion. Same group, same parties. Well, I decided that for myself, I was going to, I was going to end up in New York because that was where I found uh, the kind of acceptance I wanted and the opportunities were there because the infrastructure was there. The museums were there, the collectors were there. And that's why I went back there a second time. I came back here in the hope of using that new connection in New York to bring things to Los Angeles, which I succeeded in doing, bringing them here, but I, I wasn't able to sell the volume of work that was necessary to sustain a gallery that was acting like a museum. I mean, the catalogs I did, the ads I ran, uh, it, it just wouldn't work any longer. So. The second chance came to go to Marlboro, and I went. And from that time on, uh, it was downhill. It, <laughs> well, it depends who's hill. <laughs> you know, d downhill when it's a uh, 300 feet in the ground is not a good place. Now, one to go. thing you've all talked about, and, and Everett was one of the first people who tried to do it, was that people had the idea that really top-notch, A-plus work wasn't being shown in Los Angeles. Yeah, sure. Everybody went to New York to buy, but Everett can talk a little bit about really trying to do that at the second gallery that you opened. Well, at the, at the second gallery that I, that I opened, I had all these New York connections, and, uh, and I knew all the abstract expressionists. I was the only uh, kid allowed to sit at their table in the Cedars bar because I was always with David Smith, and pretty soon I'd walk in, they'd say, sit down, kid. So it was, a, it was a rare opportunity. And I said, well, they want to know about Los Angeles, so I painted a rosy picture. I said, sir, you've got to show your work there. It's about to explode. So I was able to get a New York artists to come, and then I was able to get the New York dealers to give me work so I could put together museum-grade shows. For Sidney Janis gave me an ARP sculpture show with about 40 pieces in it. I got a, a Gorky drawing show with about 35 <coughs> drawings. I had a, a, a Jasper Johns retrospective with the help of Leo Castelli. I had a Dada exhibit, and on and on. And I brought them like clockwork. Every month was a new show. But I was actually functioning as a, as a, as a museum without any admission charge. And I wasn't selling a, enough work in Los Angeles. I was educating incipient collectors, and it is known of collectors that they like to buy the work in some place glamorous to go so they can say, where did you get this, Fred? I got it, uh, I got it in New York. So I saw the handwriting on the wall. Yes, I was educating them, but I wasn't selling the pictures. Henry, and, uh, what? and it was a, a good time, you know, to, uh, it was a good time to, to go back, go to Marlboro. And it was a, a smart move because in, within 90 days after I got to Marlboro, I was offered the job at the Guggenheim and a very interesting career in the, in the museum world began right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you follow the path that works for you, but you can, in following that path, you can influence the whole art scene in a lot of different places. Well, one of the one of the points made earlier by Andrew and the thing that you're talking about, Everett, is the fact that 
there was a time, thank heaven it does not exist now, but there was a time when Los Angeles suffered a terrible inferiority complex in relationship to New York. And when Irving would bring out a Joseph Albers show, or would bring out a Warhol show, or so forth and so on, or when you would bring out Nicky Sanfall, or, or Tingley, or whatever, or David Smith, and when Virginia would bring out Philip Guston, and Yves Klein, and Franz Klein, the people here were so insecure in their starting to collect, and their being organized, that they would look at the examples and say, well, I guess I better just go to New York and look and see what they have there, because they can't possibly be sending their best stuff to the yeah, West they Coast. Were saying to us well, of course, that was totally wrong. We know that in, in history, and we know that from the object that they sent. But the absurd part of that was that that existed for years and for years and for years, which impacted all of you dealers in a, in a major way, as, 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 and were, negatively, obviously, in a major were, way. You know? There were five, five hard years when, yep. when we couldn't win the hearts of these people. We won their interest, but we couldn't get them to buy here in the quantities. Uh -huh. It wasn't good enough if it was here. Why is right. it here? It must be second class. Well, Patty, Which tell your Everdell and uh, tell your uh, uh, Andre Emmerich story. Yeah. When Betty and I opened with Morris Lewis, we invited Andre Emmerich out with the exhibition. And he came here, and uh, I'm, I'm repeating myself just from earlier today, right? Because <laughs> they were. Right. <laughs> a few million people. There, there were, uh, he was, uh, he didn't believe me, Andre, when I said that the reason we're doing this is because of this gross inferiority complex that we have to get over here. And he came out with this beautiful show and everybody vied to give us an opening night dinner. Finally, Eli Broad went out. And we all were at Eli's house. And it was a lovely, lovely evening, a lovely dinner after the opening. And there were collectors galore there, and there were- It was a Morris Lewis was, show, by the way. It was a Morris Lewis show. It was Morris Lewis, yes. And this one couple went up to Andre at this dinner and said, we've always wanted a Morris Lewis. And, and now we're more excited than ever but we do feel we have to come to New York. Well, and listen. Andre said, the best things I have are here. Well, you know, you have to understand, here's, a, here's an anecdote to, I'm sure you don't know. How did Andre Emmerich happen to have Morris Lewis? I'll tell you how he got Morris Lewis. Morris Lewis was one of the up and coming stars at French and Company. And with French and Company fell into hard times it was an old antique firm, and uh, behind in everything, they had to close their business and sell out. It was a family business. And that's when uh, French and Company had to close that very promising gallery. Well, there I was, the director, and here I had six, some younger artists who needed to be placed. Morris Lewis, Kenneth Nolan, Jules Olitsky, for example, uh, were, uh, were the younger stars, and uh, I knew Andre very well, a uh, cordial relationship, and I called him and said, this is, the news isn't out yet, but French and Company is closing. I urge you to take these three artists, and he did. That is why Andre Emmerich had Morris Lewis, and that wouldn't have happened if the Los Angelino me wasn't there to put it in his hands. So we, you know, it was we worked together in strange ways. Well, in stories like that, I, I have to add this one because it's a uh, it's apocryphal, like the story you're talking about. Because we have always talked about New York, we've talked about this inferiority complex, we've talked about all of these different things. But one of the first exhibitions of the New York Abstract People uh, was actually at Frank Pearl's Gallery in Los Angeles, for which Robert Motherwell wrote the catalog. Okay and named it, in fact, the New York School, but in that exhibition were Clifford Still from San Francisco and Washington, Robert Butterwell from Washington, Mark Rothko from Oregon, and Philip Gustin, and Jackson Pollock from Los Angeles. How it ever became the New York School, you'll never know, but that's another example of how that happened. We had the genes. We had the genes. We had the genes. Well, no, we didn't have the luck in those first few years. <laughs> that's true. Unquestionably, though, well, first, for any 
researchers in the audience, the French and Company archives are at the Getty Research Institute and available for you to use. But then one of the things that really changed that impression of Los Angeles was the founding of Gemini Gel. And Stanley, why don't you take us through that? Okay, well, um, I'm glad I don't have to follow Irving. Uh, I need to get a new, a new agent. Um, um, I went to uh, USC with uh, Sidney Felsen, and we were Trojans. And um, uh, I'm proud to say, <laughs> we also went when uh, Lisa and I got married, and we were this uh, uh, team that got interested in art a lot because not knowing about uh, uh, that Henry had put together this uh, UCLA Extension School, so we went to uh, uh, many of the classes, uh, 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 theater and uh, uh, literature and uh, poetry, but the art classes were wonderful, and uh, people like uh, Henry and uh, uh, Shirley Hopps, Walter Hopps, I don't think Irving you ever taught any of those, but uh, uh, they were great classes. And um, uh, we decided, uh, Sid Felsen was an accountant and he decided he wanted to go more in the art world. He was a, a ceramist and he had gone to Chenard and Otis and uh, Barnsdall, but um, he was looking for an area and one day he said, how about lithography? And so he said, well, that seemed like a good idea. There was no business plan. Uh, it was just, it's, it seemed like a good idea at the time, sort of thing. Curiosity was the business plan, so, and keeping alive. Um, so we, uh, uh, he said, fine, I, I, I know a few uh, uh, printers, because uh, um, we had known the Tamron group, and uh, uh, Ken Tyler was one of the printers, and we got together with him, this was 1965, and um, he said, yes, he'd, he'd, he'd like to have a little different situation, because he really didn't want to handle the business end of it, and so we uh, uh, started it, and so we started to look for the artists, and the, um, we thought it was best to go to the older artists because they wouldn't be around as long and it would be better for history. And we were very much affected by T Tatiana Grossman in ULAE in New York who had really uh, started this amazing uh, uh, print shop. And so um, we, went to, uh, uh, we went to Edward Hopper, uh, who was living in Washington Square, and he said, uh, I only do about one painting a year, and uh, but I can give you one of these uh, uh, my etching plates to restrike, and we said, well, that's not exactly what we had in mind, um, so we uh, we probably should have done it because later on, years later, we had worked with Andy Warhol with uh, Vote McGovern. We were very proud of that, and then he came out with the Velvet Underground, and we said, Andy, come on in for a big project, and. Uh, he, he always said yes to, yeah, yeah, I'll come in, I'll come in. And he said, yeah, come on in. He, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, give me a lithography stone. And he said, I'll take it around with me as I travel, and I'll touch it, and I'll do things to it. And uh, <laughs> that isn't what, exactly what we had in mind. And I, I was always sorry we didn't do that. We, we did hear uh, Lou Reed that night and Nico, and we saw the Velvet Underground. So. Uh, but anyway, we were looking for who to do, and we went to uh, Barnett Newman, we went to uh, um, Clifford Steele, we went to uh, um, uh, Rothko. They all said yes, but they were older and they were busy. And then one day, uh, uh, the turning point, Robert Rauschenberg, because of LA County Museum, uh, he had won the Venice Biennale and then kind of retired and went uh, with the uh, Merce Cunningham and, uh, uh, and uh, the dance group and he was the artistic director. And uh, then he started his own dance group, LA County sponsored it, and it was roller skating at, uh, in Culver City. And so we got to know him a little bit. And, uh, Pelican uh, was the great name of yes. that performance. But the, the story, I jumped a little, we finally said, well, let's start with someone and we had bought a painting of Albers from Irving Blum. Little did we know that he had raised the price by a third, and I'd, for <laughs> I'd forgotten to ask him for the discounts. So, Irving, you so. Joseph Albers. It's worth Joseph the Albers, price, you paid for it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the, the, price on, the price on yeah. the big well, painting at that time was $700, yeah, and you well, bought a small so one. I'm That's sure it was a third higher. Why don't so, we go to slide number 14? 
we'll, the, we'll get the motion. Right. And so, so we started uh, with Albers, and that took a year, and then we did Rauschenberg, and then uh, Rauschenberg had been Albers, uh, Albers had been Rauschenberg's teacher at Black Mountain, and then it kind of fell in place. The artists that we wanted, after Bob came out, uh, people like Jasper Johnson. Oh, oh, well, that <laughs> he came out, and he had no idea what he wanted to do. Um, each artist, I was saying earlier, is much different. Like Roy Lichtenstein would come out and each time it transforms the shop. And we had the opportunity, because artists don't like people looking over their shoulder, but in, in printing they have to collaborate. So we get the chance to see them uh, working. And we tried to be an artist workshop and, and, and support them in whatever they did and have good printers and good equipment there to do it. And so he found a little, um, a scrunched up drawing in the street that was a rocket booster. So he said, well, I'm going to do something booster, and he called it Booster and Seven, Seven Studies. And then he said, I want to do my self-portrait, and so I want to do it as an x-ray. So we had to search around and find someone who would take a, uh, 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 this x-ray of him. He had to do it in three parts, and it was enough um, uh, radiation. They said, you can't take another x-ray for a year. And uh, he, uh, and one of the uh, 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 urologists, something he has a full bladder or something there. <laughs> but uh, it, so he did this. This you know, he, he just works intuitively, and and that was kind of our our uh, turning point. And then it, that's how we start. But this, I mean, I think that this print really showed what printmaking was capable of in 1967. And then, I mean, any of you jump in, how important, how many people wanted to work from around the world with Gemini and came into LA. Um, Gemini became famous for doing whatever it took to get an artist project done. If we actually go to the next slide, we can have um, number 15. Oh yeah, the ice bag. Well, when you're dealing with creative people, um, you find you, you have the confidence in the ones you believe in, and uh, you, you find out what they want to do, and then do your best to do what they want to do. Provide. Well, art and technology was happening at that time, and Claus Oldenburg had come in um, to do a project with the Disney people. And uh, Let me they, just give a little background. Yeah. Maurice Tuckman conceived of this project called Art and Technology that would be a new way of making art, pairing artists with high technology companies to achieve objects that they couldn't make under normal studio conditions. And Oldenburg was paired with the Disney company. Yeah, and he, so he, uh, he liked things that were, uh, sculpture was like a human body, hard and soft, and he, he seemed to have this way of, in New York with plaster things do hard things, and in Los Angeles he felt it was a little different, and uh, Lincoln Fabric and Irving was talking about it, uh, the sewing, he did softer things here, but he felt that a, a, a beanbag ashtray was the ideal thing, but, a, but a, a, uh, a ice bag would do it, and it was hydraulically driven, and he had this idea, because it was also uh, somewhere along the line, the, uh, the World's Fair in Osaka was uh, wanted a piece, and so um, the Disney people wouldn't do it, so we found, again, you remember the name of the group, uh, the... Uh, Sid and Marty Croft. The Croft people had a, a Saturday morning show, and somehow we tracked them down, they said they would build it for Gemini, so we, uh, it was one of the examples of, you know, just going, you said, well, we'll build it for you, so... Uh, um, it was a uh, it was a, uh, a exciting project. I think the Disney people felt an ice bag would be a, like a headache. It was the wrong corporate image for something, <laughs> which which they later got in the in the news. <laughs> they got several things they needed ice bags for. But it's uh, it's a great irony though that this the most famous piece that came out of a project that was supposed to be about high technology was actually built by the people who built H.R. Puffin stuff and by Gemini, by a print workshop. workshop. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, I think... Well, I, if I could just take three minutes, I'd, I'd like to take three minutes, because I think there's some, all of this conversation that we're relating to and we can't ever get everything in an evening no matter what happens, 
But I think there's some building blocks we should all just mention and, and remember. Uh, and it seems to me that they really make a certain amount of sense in terms of what's happened and how important, in fact, the Los Angeles scene has become. Uh, first, obviously, the galleries, the galleries that you've been talking about and what, what happened and giving credibility to local artists, which, in fact, the museums were not doing at that time. And, in fact, the galleries were carrying the, the scene for that. Then the building of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art uh, and the founding of the Contemporary Art Council, which is a group of people, collectors, who began to collect for the first time. A series of classes taught through UCLA Extension that, in fact, got people very much involved. And while we were supposed to be there teaching about modern art, by that I mean Picasso and Brock and so forth and so on, we always added a few slides to the local Los Angeles artists at the end so they could be conscious of that. So education was a very major, major part. And every dealer at that time was as much an educator as he was a dealer, as a matter of fact. If they were relying on making money, that didn't make sense, but educating was great. Then major collectors emerged through the Contemporary Art Council, such as David Bright, whose collection, all the paintings went to Lackman, all of the sculptures started the Murphy Sculpture Garden at UCLA, Betty Freeman, uh, we can go on the Wiseman's, we can go on forever. In terms of that arena, that then began. Uh, Maurice's being here was tremendously important at the early phase of his career, uh, which is something that very few people remember or recognize that he originated uh, the moment he came here, he started originating uh, exhibitions such as American Sculpture of the 60s, the David Smith Show, the uh, Art and Technology Exhibition, Ron Kitai. And the history of Los Angeles was that we had never originated exhibitions, all right? We borrowed from the Museum of Modern Art, borrowed from Chicago, and suddenly there were articles in Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek Magazine of exhibitions that actually began here in Los Angeles. Then along with that, in 1968, we became the most populous state in the nation, and people began to pay attention. Art Forum magazine played a tremendous role in the, in the evolution of what transpired here. So there's material for 65 panel discussions, obviously, that we'll never hit, but, I, but I'm just... No, no, I think, I think we should talk a little bit about some Can we do things. an evening on the missteps? <laughs> I thought this was what it. Missteps? We never made missteps. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> I mean, one thing, as Henry brought up, is that tonight, really, what we're talking about is the support structure of the art world. I mean, normally, these conversations, we've had a lot with artists and with being a research institute, scholars, curate, but they, artists don't by themselves make an art center. And I think that one thing that's hard to realize now is that when Irving, Everett, all of you started, there really was no support network here. Um, so talk a little bit about trying to educate uh, collectors, um, Oh, I have, uh, I have uh, an, an apocryphal story. Um, I, sh I gave Andy his first show. Andy had no gallery. I found him in New York. A long story, which I won't go into now. You, you, can, you can read it in Playboy. Um, um, my second Warhol show, this was in 1962, I, uh, the summer of 1962, I showed 32 soup can paintings, uh, ringed the gallery with them. My second show, was uh, the Elvis Presley paintings. And we had a situation behind the gallery proper, which I used for storage and the odd time uh, for exhibitions. And I had in that back area uh, 10 paintings, flesh colored on a silver ground of Elizabeth Taylor, uh, done by Andy. He sent me a series of 10 of these and I had those hanging in the back and one day uh, a very elegantly dressed lady, it's 1963, you know, quite some time ago, um, elegantly dressed lady comes in and uh, looks at the Presley paintings, says to me, any more? And I say, yeah, we have an edition in the back. I, I have more paintings by the same artist. And I'd love to show them to you. And I take her back and she looks at the, at the Liz Taylor paintings. She says to me, um, 
this is some kind of joke. And I explained that it isn't a joke. And he said, well, why? I mean, why isn't it a joke? And uh, I asked her if she has a little time. She said she had all the time in the world. And I explained in the best way that I could why the paintings were there, what they meant to me, why I thought they were important. Uh, she was charming, absolutely charming. At the end of this long uh, monologue, uh, she said to me, what do you ask for, for these? And I think they were $900 at the time. And she said, you know, she said, I'm going to buy one. I'm going to have some fun with it. I'll buy one. I said, you know, I didn't really give you all this information in order to sell you a painting. Uh, she said, no, they're very cheap, and uh, I, I, I really would like to buy one. And I said, wonderful. I, I couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, the show came down. I delivered the painting. Two weeks after I delivered the painting, she came back into the gallery. She was disconcerted. I could see that. Uh, I said, problem? She said, yeah. I said, what's the matter? She said, my husband hates the painting. She said, my friends hate the painting. She said, my children hate the painting. <laughs> she said, Mr. Blum, she said, you know, it's so raw, it's as if the image were torn out of the front page of the daily newspaper. And I said, yeah. you know, I can't tell you any more then you've just told me. <laughs> but it didn't work. I took the painting back, <laughs> gave her her money back, <laughs> and I sometimes think about it. Let the third. <laughs> Listen, if you want, get, getting important uh, work to Los Angeles, that was a m major challenge. Is that, I thought that was the most powerful instrument of a communal uh, education that we could do because we didn't have an educational infrastructure so we had to improvise. Why don't we put slide number three up? Yeah, so we ha well, I can talk while you're at that. Please. <laughs> <laughs> like you talk while Please. Uh, <laughs> getting the work uh, is an art form in and of itself, which is probably why the magazine was called Art Form. But it is. Let's put that one back. No. It's the oh. Helen Franklin no, Wait a minute. Oh. There we are. There we are. I like the run up. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's an ad that I put in Art International for the Helen Frankenthaler show. And I f if, if I was to get important work out of New York, I had to make people in Europe see my gallery and Los Angeles as a, as a worthy art market. And the way I did it was to, it was to put in rather splashy ads in Art International, which was read all over the world, but its rates were very low. I could get the outside back cover of Art International or the inside back cover in color for a, for, for a, a, a little ad of a, of a lingerie shop in Los Angeles. I mean, it was, it was, it was really too, too good a bargain to walk away from. So I ran these ads of, of, uh, of, of the, uh, shows like this and David Smith, and then I had access to the work from the New York dealers because they saw a, a gold mine here and the New York artists had a fantasy that there was a whole new field of uh, collectors for them. So then we started to be able to bring the work here. We knew, Irving and I knew, are there any lawyers in the audience? <laughs> we, we there was another reality. <laughs> <laughs> well, we knew that, uh, that that hadn't happened yet. But if we didn't do what we were doing, we wouldn't have been able to bring the good stuff. That's true. And that's why I could bring, uh, in one season, Frankenthaler to David Smith, to, uh, Tingley, uh, the Dada School with good stuff. And we had to do the job of the museum that we did not yet have. <laughs> and if we had not done it, uh, it would have been bad news. We might have, we might have dropped off the scope. We, it, it could have happened, you know. We have Art International up, but talk about the impact that Art Forum had when oh, it came yeah. down yeah, to... Yeah, this is interesting. That we had this ma uh, magazine that began what was in San Francisco, yeah. and then it moved down here, Art Forum. It was really a good art magazine, well-written, good layout, just spiffy. And it, was, it had such a small circulation that uh, its advertising rates were very low. 
So I put in very in incredibly intelligent, yeah, critical the, views. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, their reviews, their which review, we've never had. their reviews were very, very good. So I advertised very actively in that. Everything I did was advertised in Art Forum, and then pretty soon I started to hear from people in Europe that they knew about Los Angeles a as an art venue because they read Art Forum, and it, it just worked. It was a way to get the message across. So we had to. We weren't just educating our collectors, we were educating sources of art in other places that we had something worthwhile and to let us bring the stuff here. Want to show that Ferris ad? Pardon me? Absolutely. The uh, Ferris ad. Number, if you could find slide it. number six. Slide six. Yeah, let's see the Ferris ad. Uh, one, one back. We'll get to that. Uh, so, uh, that, Irving that Telsma. Was, uh, extremely popular advertisement for the gallery. <laughs> um, uh, the, the lady uh, on the right is Peggy Claxton, and she was Rudy Gernrich's top model. She modeled the, uh, the, the topless bathing suit. I knew Peggy very well. Peggy Moffat is how uh, she Peggy Moffat, yeah. And the, Patty was a uh, model for that, Rudy, too. I know. And the boat was owned by Bill Claxton's brother. <laughs> and uh, Bill Claxton told me that his brother had just bought this boat and hadn't put the name on the back. And so we organized this shoot, and I bought the letters, Ferris Gallery, you can see on the back, and I kind of, with masking tape, <laughs> nice job, applied them to the back of the boat. <laughs> nice, uh, nice job. <laughs> and then this ad was taken out in Art Forum. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, because this is where the two about projecting a certain image. And this is one of Patty's photographs of the artists in Irving's gallery. gallery Patty, do you want to talk a little bit about how this photo came about? Oh, I had just gotten a camera. I just gotten a camera, a Hasselblad. And I started taking pictures. And then I knew all these artists from Ferris Gallery. And so I invited them over to my studio and I took all these pictures of them, different they, kinds. They got raucous. <laughs> yeah, they got really funny. Yeah, they're pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. And there's Keenholz and Al. Al at the top and Moses at the bottom. And Billy Al Banks and Ed Moses at the very bottom. Bob Irwin. Bob Irwin. And Bob uh, Irwin. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Could you also show the War Babies poster? Because I see the American flag over here on the in this side of this. Could you? Well, let's just stay with this for one minute because. Uh -huh. Your artist, and this image I think is very critical in it, later became known as the Studs. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So they, they even had an <laughs> exhibition under that title. And that sort of right. self, as you said, there was no one else to create an image. So you, you created one for yourself. They like to pretend they were very tight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But and I then there to... was the other one where they were all in a line like a daisy tree. That's right, exactly. Oh. That's I right. like that one. That's a good one. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, make, uh, having a gallery that was super large for its time, I got a lot of mileage uh, out of that because when Soho started to go, which wasn't long after that, people would say, this kid had the first Soho-sized gallery in the world. Yeah. And probably so. Well, that little remark helped tremendously. Yeah. Time and time. If your work is big, take it and show it in a, in a Soho-sized gallery. Exactly. Why not? Let's go to slide number 10. Yeah, I just want to be self-indulgent for a minute because I, I suddenly, you know, when you teach and you show slides and you put them in a different juxtaposition, uh, you suddenly learn something. And I just learned something, seeing the American flag in that painting of all of the Ferris Gallery artists, which is so reminiscent of the poster that Joe Good suggested for uh, the exhibition we did at the Heisman Gallery called War Babies. Uh, it was his idea, it was uh, the idea that artists were born about 1936-1937. They were all students at Chouinard. Uh, and Jerry McMillan, who was one of them, did the photograph in this case of the War Babies poster, uh, of the American flag with crumbs on it, and the four artists of different uh, heritages uh, eating the symbol of their heritage, Ed, Ed Burrell eating his watermelon, Larry Bell being Jewish, eating a bagel, uh, Joe Good being Catholic, <laughs> eating a mackerel, and Ron Miyashiro eating with chopsticks. And when we presented this exhibition, 
Nobody remembers the exhibition, but the poster has become classic, obviously. Exactly. It was the first fully integrated exhibition other than women, I should say, that, that had, had occurred. Uh, secondarily, it was a moment in time when the John Birch Society existed, a very right-wing organization which wrote death threats to us on a regular basis to the show. <laughs> And then the left wing got on us because we were using these cliche images of the watermelon and the bagel and so forth and so on. Uh, so it became a, a wonderful thing, but now I need to know, from my own historical point of view, did the Ferris poster with the flag come before this with the studs, or these studs come before that uh -oh. in terms of the, of, of the history? Because the flag, you remember those were days when there was a lot of there were a lot of issues about the flags in exhibitions of art. You know, people would burn the flag, people would do this, people would do that, people wouldn't hang. They would close up exhibitions if the flag was shown, all that kind of stuff. And uh, now I need to know that. When so, was your show? Uh, 1960. Uh, this was done in 58. 58. Okay, well, that's interesting. All right. Sorry, sorry, that would be before. That's interesting. Sorry. That's okay. great. Yeah. But yeah. But one thing okay. that this glad to know. I'll jump in. One thing, this War Babies, uh, this very in-your-face artistic advertising, which maybe reached its zenith with the ads that Robert Morris took out in Art Forum where he was dressed in a, uh, in a Nazi outfit and, you know, the famous one with Linda Benglis. Linda Benglis was pretty shocking. And the dildo, but that really begins, I think, in LA with yeah. the ads that we're talking about here and with uh, the one that Ed Ruscha took out, uh, yeah. 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 Goodbye yeah. to College yeah. Days. Yeah. Judy Chicago Edward. taking yeah. the name Chicago with the boxing ring and stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Well, and Judy Chicago doing the women's uh, program. And, and pop art please. from Los Angeles, from the shows here that Irving had from the pop art show at the Tony Museum. Where'd you say the photo say the whole mic? I did, did you not hear me, everybody? <laughs> uh, Lawrence Alloway in the, in the 60s was the first person, I believe, to coin the phrase pop art. That's right. And it comes from Irving's show of Andy and also a pop art show that was at the County Museum. Also, I think you know he was English and yeah. Richard Hamilton. And That's there right. were those yeah, people London, in yes. England as Tootsie well. Pop. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Blake. And, uh, mm -hmm. So that whole thing Jones. went together and it formed that. It came from here, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. It really yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one thing we can talk about is how receptive Los Angeles was to pop art, that both Warhol's first exhibition and the first museum exhibition, New Painting of Common Objects you know, in Pasadena. No, no, nobody I was working with at the time more receptive, I must say, as I think back on it now, than Dennis Hopper, who was very close to the gallery and a good friend. And I saw quite a lot of him at the time. Uh, he was married to uh, Brooke Hayward. And I was friendly with, uh, with both of them. And I remember his coming by the gallery. And I showed him transparencies of these cartoons by Roy Lichtenstein. And Dennis looked hard at them and ran out of the gallery and came back the next day in his car, and he said, I want to take you somewhere. And I said, where are we going? He said, get in the car. And I got in the car, and we drove downtown uh, here in LA to Foster and Kleiser, a big billboard, billboard company. And he bought uh, five or six very large scale billboards and took them home. And as I watched, he cut them in various ways and took a few days to cut them and then uh, plastered uh, his bedroom with these uh, enormous uh, billboards, uh, made this kind of billboard collage. In other words, he just, he, he just sensed the, the, the decorative aspect of this pop style, which wasn't even a style uh, at, that, at that moment. Uh, he just had a notion about it, and his notion was, uh, was exactly correct. Yeah. Jim Rosenquist approach. You know, Al exactly. Al Al when Alloway came to the Guggenheim, uh 
Uh -huh. uh, he got there just about the same time they hired me. And uh, he, had, uh, 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 he had such good ideas, and he was well versed what was going on in, in this country. But th th he wasn't really allowed to do very much at the Guggenheim, hmm. uh, which was too bad. Yeah. He, had, uh, he had that kind of vision, like his coining the phrase. See, he, under, he studied what we were doing, then he understood it, and then he always came up with, with a good moniker. But he wasn't in the right museum to express it. I must say, I was just thinking about, you, you, you mentioned Rosenquist, the top floor mm. of, the, of the brand new Museum of Modern Art in New York is, is given over to that amazing mural size painting of F-111 by uh, Jim Rosenquist. It is extraordinary to see. Even so though it's, it's to see flat, you've always seen it curved, you know. Which is the way it was meant, originally meant to be, was, yep, was they, curved around the Castelli Gallery. Exactly. But